Well, good morning to everyone at Collective Hope Church. I'm Mel Crothers, and it's so wonderful to be joining you this morning as we worship our wonderful God. Most of us have an example of God's faithfulness in our lives, a time where we've seen his character, his nature. We have an example of his goodness to draw from. If you're tuned in this morning, the likelihood is that you have a history with God. A time where you could draw on, where you have a story of his faithfulness in your life. Why do I know this? Because that is who our God is. He is faithful. He is true. He is loving. And as we reflect on that displayed in our lives, there's really only one response. And that is to worship. To worship and for his praises to ever be on our lips. There's a wonderful Psalm, Psalm 30. It says, you did it. You turned my deepest pain into joyful dancing. You stripped off my dark clothing and covered me with joyful light. You have restored my honor. My heart is ready to explode, erupt in new songs. It's impossible to keep quiet. Eternal one, my God, my life giver, I will thank you forever. This morning, I want to encourage you as we enter into this time of worship and song, no matter where you find yourself in your relationship with God, draw on that history you have with God. Draw on that time where he has shown himself faithful and your response out of that will be to praise him. I know for me, that's the reason I sing. That's the reason I worship. That's the reason his praise will ever be on my lips. Let's worship together, church. Your love is devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old Your love is enduring Through the wind and rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been And faithful you will be yourself to me and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my makes us whole and you shoulder our weakness and your strength becomes our own and you're making me like you clothing me in white bringing beauty from ashes cause you will have your bride free from all her guilt and rid of all her shame Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips.
It's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips.
like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here belong will be forever mine will be In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, Fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory sin's curse has lost its grip on me precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my
Hey Church, thanks for joining us for a time of worship and I hope that wherever you're watching us that you are sensing the presence of the Lord and I hope that you're doing safe and well and I hope that wherever you are, you're sensing the peace of the Lord and that you're at peace and I hope that you're doing well.
Before we get into the word, I'd like to let you know of a few things. Firstly, we have a connect card that's coming up on the screen right now. What that is, is a way for you to connect with us. If you have a prayer request or an amazing testimony you'd like to share with us, feel free to use the QR code or the link that's in the description, and we'd love to hear from you. Also use the comment section as well if you'd like to just say hi and uh, let us know what you think about the service so far. We also have our social networks, that is Facebook and Instagram. Feel free to follow us there to get daily devotionals and to go know a little bit more about the life of our church. And it's also a way for you to know how to attend church services in person if you can make it. We hope to see you there on social networks out there and we hope to see you in the comments as well. We also have our prayer meeting that's coming up on the first Saturday of next month. Hope to see you there in person if you can make it in person in Perth. If not, feel free to pray with us during the time. We'd love to be able to pray alongside with other people in the things that's going on in the world and within the city of Perth and also within um, your life and the personal lives of everyone who is at church. All right, before we get into the Word, I'd like to pray for you before we get into the Word. Father Lord, I just want to thank you for this time. Thank you that you've gathered us here together in the place where we can gather together, even if we can't do so in person. I just pray, Lord, that your presence will be with us, Lord, as we listen to the word, as we listen to the message, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you speak to us, speak to our heart. I pray that it brings insight, that you bring insight, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would bring um, wisdom and you bring knowledge, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would challenge our mindsets. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to see a new way of seeing you, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would bless us and keep us safe, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that you would also help us to be able to see you, seek you more and more in each and every day. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless. Thanks for joining us for Worship and the Word today. It's great to have you here. I hope you're doing well. If you have any prayer points, of course, please message us. We'd love to hear from you and, of course, support you in prayer, whatever ways that we possibly can. Thank you for praying for Natalie as she recovers from her knee surgery. She's doing well, praise God. But uh, anyone who's had a, a knee replacement or any major knee surgery would know it's quite a process, quite a long process. And she's in that long recovery period right now. But thank God he is looking after her. While you're turning with me to Matthew chapter 12, let me just say if you're a parent or a grandparent, an uncle or an aunt, I'm sure you have seen either first hand or second hand <laughs> the mess that kids can make permanent mark of being used to draw magnificent works of art, but on walls where these things don't belong. Or mum's mascara or makeup being used all over little faces and, you know, all over bodies and furniture and furnishings or toilet paper from one end of the house to the other. How can things that are so small make messes that are so big? <laughs> Good question. And then, of course, the stories of kids who want to help clean up. So the dishwashing liquid is used all over the TV set or your iPhone, or your clothes were washed in the toilet bowl, or a vacuum cleaner being used to vacuum things that it should not be vacuuming. Kids can make quite a mess indeed. And what's that got to do with the text? Not much at all other than the idea of cleaning up. But Matthew 12, I want to read from verses 43 to 45. We're kind of in this part of Matthew's gospel. We've moved around a little bit, but I want to kind of wrap up this, uh, this chapter this week and next week, and then week after that, move on from there. But Matthew 12, 43 to 45, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I'll return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. I want to read a second verse, John 14, 23. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them and we will come into them and make our home with them. Let's pray. We just thank you again today, God, for how wonderful you are to us. You reveal to us in Jesus your goodness, your gracious work, your kindness, your mercy. You're so good to us in Jesus and we thank you. And today as we talk about things of this world and things of the demonic world, we're reminded that you're the God that wants to save us from all of that, protect us from all of that. And of course, you want to live with us in our lives and have us living in your life too. Help us to live this out by faith today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If we could somehow find a way to see into the heavenlies, 
I wonder what we would see. No, I'm not talking about a telescope. I'm not talking about stars or the Milky Way or whatever the latest batch of images are from NASA's new powerful space telescope. Those heavenlies are beautiful indeed. I'm talking about the other heavenlies, the spiritual realm where Satan and his minions have been waging an attempted coup d'etat against the creator, the owner and the ruler of the universe. If we could see that, I'm sure we would see, how, see things that would indeed shock us to the core. On the one hand, we would see sheer glory and goodness, power and majesty, the mercy and grace of God, a kingdom that knows no end, the wonderful glory of God's kingdom. And then we would see on the other side, nothing but pure evil, because evil is never content. Evil does not rest, does not pull back. Oh, if only we could see. If only we could see the strongholds of a people, the way sickness can be brought upon someone, the way that poverty can be a demonic stronghold, the way that curses work. Only if we could see, if only we could see. And whilst we can't necessarily see it up there, most of us have never had that vision or that image, we can see it at work down here. Demonic possession, demonic oppression. Just walk through your local shopping centre, just read the newspaper, you'll see demonic possession, demonic obsession, demonic oppression all around us. If we knew, if we only knew, if we truly knew what was going on right now, if we could see it, we would be crying out to God. We'd be praying for demonic strongholds to be broken, crying out for God to deliver our family, our friends, our neighbours, our work colleagues, crying out, Lord, help us. From the Lord's Prayer, we pray, deliver us from the evil one, rescue us, set us free. And these are the kinds of prayers that God responds to. We know this because Scripture is full of these kinds of prayers. Psalm 50 verse 15, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. A beautiful psalm many of us know well, Psalm 32 verse 7, you are my hiding place. You'll protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. Do you remember the, e the Hebrews were, of course, in Egypt and during their time there in bondage and captivity to the work of Pharaoh? Exodus 2 tells us in verse 23, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out and their cry for help, of course, went up to God. God heard their cry for deliverance and he set them free from bondage. He brought them out of Egypt. This is who God is. He's the God of deliverance. In the Old Testament, time and time again, we see this in the gospel accounts. Time and time again, we see this. God delivers his people from the work of the evil one. Mark 1.34 says, Jesus drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew him. <laughs> I love that. He cast them out and he silenced them. Don't you love it? And 1 John 3 verse 8, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. This is good news. This is who God is. This is what God does, which brings us back to Matthew chapter 12. You may recall in this chapter, and of course, go away, read the whole chapter in context. Earlier on, back in verse 22, Jesus has freed a man from demonic oppression. You would think this would be good news, but no, the Pharisees wrongly accused Jesus of being himself demon-possessed, verse 24, as if the devil's in the habit of casting out demons. What a ridiculous thought. And then from that point onwards, as the chapter unfolds, Jesus addresses their stubbornness before coming back here in verse 43, back to the topic of demonic possession. Again, he's returning to the topic at hand. This shift from verses 42 to 43 is not quite as sharp as it may seem. But here we learn some interesting things about the nature of the demonic and even about human nature too, that the devil lies. The devil, of course, lies to us and our flesh and the world around us lie as well. I want to encourage us from the word of God today to come to Jesus and place ourselves in his care. He is safe and we are safe with him. I want to encourage you, if you sense darkness in your life at the moment, if you sense the demonic in your life, if you sense bondage, Jesus is here to set you free. He is the deliverer. And of course, he wants to come and make his home with us, as we just read in the second passage. You don't need to put up with darkness. You don't need to put up with demonic. You don't need to be apathetic or be lax. We can't afford to be ignorant here. We must be vigilant in casting out, resisting the evil one. James 4 verse 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Praise God. We can stand firm in Jesus. Praise God. He sets his people free. Praise God. He makes his home with us. Praise God. 
We have a better life in him than we ever knew in bondage to the evil one. This topic, these topics, truth be told, are big and challenging topics. Most Christians don't even think about them and often don't even get it. And I want to be careful here. I want to make sure we get a, a, a good sense of balance here, that we don't overplay our interest in the demonic, nor should we underplay our interest in the demonic either. We need to get this balance right carefully. Uh, why I know some people who think they can just cast out demons out of someone and then walk away. You can't do that. Jesus tells us quite clearly here that casting out demons requires follow up and follow through, it requires love and care. And in addition to the spiritual power, it requires discipleship. He tells us in verse 45, the final condition of a person where demons have come back with more is worse than they were in the beginning. We need to avoid that kind of behavior. We had some young guys attend one of our churches a number of years ago. Two great young men with great potential in the things of God, great callings and giftings upon their lives. Lots of enthusiasm, but they lacked wisdom. This particular day, they'd come to visit me to have coffee in the office, and they told me with great, <laughs> great eagerness and joy that they'd been casting out these demons around the place and how many demons they'd cast out. It kind of shocked me, it became apparent to me and quite concerning to me they were treating it like notches on their belts. And straight away, I thought about this, these verses, this text right here in Matthew chapter 12. I referred to what Jesus says. I said to them, what have you done to stop the demon coming back with seven more? And they looked at me and said, I hadn't even thought about it. It's tragic. You can't go around treating demonic stuff like a game to play. And you can't go around blaming everything on the demonic either, which is not the point we're making here today either. Conversely, we can't ignore it. You can't live as if the demonic is not taking place. It's real. So I want us to balance this out. We can't overplay it. We can't be too interested in it. We can't run around looking for it. That's a bit foolish. But we can't ignore it either. Let's focus on the second thought for a moment. A friend of mine was doing missionary work in Africa and took a friend of his, both Aussie blokes, took a friend of his, a pastor from the East Coast, to a, a missions trip and they were there on this missions trip in Africa and saw lots of demonic stuff taking place, lots of demons cast out. And this guy, this pastor commented to my friend, you know, okay, it happens here in Africa, but it doesn't happen back in Australia. No, nah, it's not there. And my friend, I reckon he had a word of knowledge right here. I reckon he heard something from God and spoke it out of his mouth. He said, how many church splits has your church gone through? And this guy said, three, why? My friend said, because that's the demonic. It's manifesting in your church. When you go home, confront it in Jesus' name. And you know what? He was right. And it did. And they cast it out. This is the nature of living in this spiritual world. Again, if we could only see what's really taking place. This is why we pray. This is one reason why we pray. We pray and say, God, give me insight into what's taking place here in this problem in my life. Give me insight into what's taking place in this family member's life right now. To give me insight into this resistance, this bondage, this area where life is difficult. What's taking place here? Is it a demonic stronghold? And of course, we bring it to Christ for him to cast out. I want us to, to get this sense of, of, of perspective that, that God, of course, can deal with these things. We need God to show us how to deal with these things, how to pray into these things, of course, and see Jesus have the victory in these areas. Praise God, we have the power in Christ. We have the ability in Jesus to stand firm in him. We don't need to fear, of course, what the evil one is doing. We can stand firm in Jesus and see this stuff dealt with. Praise God. Let me just talk for a moment about the way the text talks about the house being clean. The demons cast out and the house is clean. Something I see here is the way that people kind of live with their life as if they can merely live a good life, a moral life, a, a life that's clean and nice, looks good, looks good on the surface. And of course, they can live a moral kind of existence and not worry too much about being fanatical for Jesus. There's no such thing as, as a non-spiritual life. It doesn't exist. There's no, <laughs> there's no reality where there's not a demonic force at work or the spirit of God at work. That's the nature of the spiritual. We live in a spiritual world. There is a vacuum there that must be, of course, filled with something. You either fill it with the Spirit of God 
spirit of the resurrected Jesus, or you fill it with the demonic. Take your pick. And in the picture here that Jesus creates in this text in Matthew 12, the demon's been cast out, but it's not been filled with the life of God. So there's a vacuum there. Therefore, the demon can come back with seven more and fill that vacuum. That's the thing for us to avoid. We can't live ignorant here. We can't be naive here. We can't live in a place that's apathetic. You're either for God or you're not. You're either with God or you're not. Let's make that picture clear in our minds. And here we must talk about the nature of the world around us, the flesh, our fallen nature, and the demonic, because these three things work together. Let's talk about the flesh for a second. There was a youth worker working in a particular church. He was rather creative and forward thinking and decided to show the youth group a missionary film. And it was a simple, safe, Christian oriented film about missions. And it was an old style film projector. Remember those things? I grew up on those things. And the movie hadn't finished for more than an hour before leaders in that church came to him to ask him what he'd done. They said, did you show the young people a film? He said, well, yeah, I did. They said, we don't like that. He wasn't trying to be argumentative, but he said, I remember the last missions conference, we showed slides and one of the church officers put up his hand to signal for him to stop. He said this, if it's still, it's fine. If it moves, it's sin. <laughs> you can show slides, you can't show movies. Now, this is ridiculous. We can look at that and go, that's just legalism. That's just craziness. But I want you to see for a second here the nature of the flesh. It doesn't just manifest in terms of rampant sin, lying or cheating or stealing or murder or sexual immorality. It also, of course, manifests in legalism and control and areas where we think we can do things and we don't need God. The flesh is that rebellious. Jesus did not come to make us good. He did not die on the cross to make us nice. He didn't come to merely sweep things out and make us look presentable. He came to give us his new life. His resurrected life has come to be ours. When we're water baptized, we're buried into his, res his, his, his burial. We're raised into his resurrection, raised in new life in him. We don't need to make our lives look good. We need to have our lives new in Jesus. He's not looking for you to be nice. He's looking to make you new. Think about this. The devil has no objection, Spurgeon says, to a house being swept clean and garnished. A moralist may truly be Satan's as much as a man of debauchery. Cleaning up your life is not enough. We don't become nice. We become new. We don't become neat. We become new. We don't become merely moral. We become new in Jesus. He comes to set up his home in us. I want every part of my life filled with the life of Jesus. The living room, the dining room, the bedroom, the study, every part filled with the life and presence of the living God. I do not want to vacuum my life where Satan can come back and bring more with him. And I hope you're the same today. I want us to see for a moment that the devil works with strategy. We can be under no illusion here. His plan is to increase his territory in the world. We can't be fooled by the invisible. We can't be taken by surprise. We must place ourselves safely in the Lord. And the second text says this, John 14, 23. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make a home with them. What a contrast between these two pictures. A place where the devil can come with his minions and set up camp. Or a place where the living God, who loved us so much to send Jesus, comes and make his home with us. This is beautiful. This is beautiful is precious. This is what, of course, he's offering to us. I want us today to have this picture in our hearts, be really clear about it. I want my life to not just look nice. I want it to be new in him. I don't want living rooms to merely be respectable. I want God to live there in those living rooms, in my heart, in my life, in my family, in my home, in my workplace. I want him present in everything. I want to give no space for the evil one. I only want the presence of the living God to be there. And of course, his power, his majesty, his glory, his goodness, his joy, his peace, all of it to come. Because where he is, those things are too. Today, we're going to examine our hearts in prayer. And that, of course, is the prayer. That we would just make a place for God to be comfortable. A place for God to be at home. 
a place for God's presence to be so real others can see it, where there's no room for the evil one. That's our prayer. Let's pray right now. We pray right now, Father, as we've looked at your word today, that you'll do something precious in hearts and lives today, that there'll be no room in any of us for the evil one to come back and set up camp, that there'll only be space for you. We want you to be comfortable in our lives. We want you to set up home in our lives. We want you to be doing something precious and wonderful in us and through us. God, have your way. God, come in your glory. God, come in your majesty. God, come and set up your life, your home in us, we pray today. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. God bless.